Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'd like to give you a brief welcome before we get started. I'm Maya Elenevsky, the Events and Outreach Manager here at the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society with the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. The ACMHE is a multidisciplinary academic association with a membership of over 700 educators, staff, students, and researchers committed to the transformation of higher education through contemplative methods. The ACMHE is an initiative of the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society. I'd like to welcome you to our April 2019 Contemplative Education webinar, Faith in a Seed, Strategies for Nurturing and Embedding Contemplative Approaches on Our Campuses with Juliet Trail. Juliet Trail, PhD, is the Director of Education for the University of Virginia Contemplative Sciences Center, CSC, launched in 28, I'm sorry, 2012 by founding and executive director David Germano with just a single full-time administrator. The CS, CSC sorry, has grown in just seven years to employ 30 full-time and dozens of part-time faculty, staff, and student interns. Juliet joined CSC in 2016 and has helped manage the curricular, co-curricular, faculty development and higher education research and assessment efforts of the center. She has taught contemplative undergraduate courses, including mindfulness and compassion towards living fully personally and professionally, and the art and science of human flourishing and facilitated a year long contemplative faculty learning community for a cohort of 17 colleagues from across disciplines and schools of the university. She will share insights and strategies that have been effective at UVA, along with others gleaned from colleagues at other institutions, including public and private four-year colleges, as well as community colleges. We are extremely excited to have her here with us today. Please welcome Juliet. Hi, thank you, Maya. Are you still able to hear me clearly? Yes, you sound great. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would really like to thank CMIND and ACMHE for inviting me to be with all of you. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to share what I hope to be some helpful framing and um, suggestions and uh, insights of a problem-solving nature, thinking about how we can nurture and embed contemplative approaches across institutional types. Uh, since I'm not on camera, I added a photo, so that's me, and hello. And I was inspired in thinking about this presentation by this wonderful quote by Henry David Thoreau. Though I do not believe that a plant will spring up where no seed has been, I have great faith in a seed. Convince me that you have a seed there, and I am prepared to expect wonders. I wanted to open with an arrival practice, and I've put the instructions on the screen in case anybody is um, accessing this visually only without access to the audio. I'm sure they could participate with us, although they'll have to guess when our opening and closing bell will be. So I, um, I'm just going to hold a, a one minute meditation here, a moment of silence for us. I invite everyone to find a comfortable seat in your chair. And if you're able to bring both feet flat onto the floor, perhaps placing any items that are in your lap or hands away onto some other surface so that your hands can rest easily in your lap. You may close your eyes or just uh, have a downward looking gaze with the eyes gently open with a soft focus. I will sound the bell to open and also to close this moment of silence.
And if your eyes are closed, I invite you to open them again and return into the room or space where you are attending this talk. For those who may have joined us, that was just a moment of silence to have a short arrival practice together. My name is Juliette Trail. I work at the University of Virginia. As Maya mentioned in her introduction, I'm Director of Education at the Contemplative Sciences Center of EPA. We are a pan-university center, so we report up through our provost office and we work with all of the 11 schools at the University of Virginia and our efforts work to serve all constituents of the university. So that will include undergraduate, graduate students, postdocs, researchers, faculty and staff of all designations. And we make the majority of what we do free and open to all members of the wider community, the local public as well, other than some things like retreats that may be geared directly towards students or faculty or faculty and staff, um, that those are close to those audiences. But other than that, the work that we do is, is we try to make it all free and available. So I wanted to open with thinking a little bit about the rationale um, behind this talk. Why is it important for us to use contemplative approaches? You may be new to contemplative approaches or um, far senior to even myself in the, in the field. Um, so I wanted to think kind of broadly about some of the factors that influence us that may be conscious for you in your own um, introduction and utilization of contemplative approaches or, or maybe slightly different than how you've framed it. But one thing that's really clear is students are really, really struggling today. They're not alone in this. Faculty and staff and others in the, in the wider world and publics are struggling as well. But with students, it's getting um, documented these ever-increasing levels of reported stress and anxiety, levels of depression. These factors can lead to things like self-harm, suicidal thoughts or actions, self-image and eating disorders. It can also lead, when we have a lot of stress in our system, to all kinds of increased risk-taking behaviors. So we might see that show up in use and abuse of drugs, alcohol. Also, with increased stress in the system, we'll see people falling back onto um, implicit biases or even conscious and explicit bias. So we see an increase also across our colleges and universities in discrimination and intolerance, acts of um, violence, hatred. Um, it also shows up in sexual harassment and assault issues. Many of these have been, you know, a, a huge issue on our campuses for 30 years or more, but the levels of stress and anxiety as they've risen have become kind of the leading concern. There was a report released um, in 2017 that interviewed college presidents and um, chief student, student affairs officers at universities. Ours is a vice president for student affairs, but the person in that role, whatever the title might be. And 60% of those that were surveyed said that uh, stress and anxiety on their campuses was their mental health was their number one concern. The number two concern, I think it was at about 40, 37%, 40% of those surveyed said their, their next concern was around diversity and inclusion versus discrimination. So there's also a growing documentation of students experiencing housing or food insecurity during their years in college. There's a growth of non-traditional student populations, however you define non-traditional. Um, every type of underrepresented group is increasing in its representation across all sectors of higher education. And our, our nation and our world are growing increasingly diverse in that way as well. People, uh, those from underrepresented populations can sometimes not have the same knowledge in, of the network handed down through family or social capital, various kinds, to be aware of what resources exist outside of just showing up, going to class, eventually getting some kind of certificate or degree. And those from underrepresented populations are also less likely to think that the resources that exist are meant for them or to actually re reach out and utilize those resources. So there's an issue with people taking advantage of what's there. And even with those taking advantage of what's there, um, counseling centers across the country are, are growing as quickly as they can find funding to do so. Uh, our UVA counseling center, I think, is triple the size that it was 20 years ago, and that's very common in higher education. 
And even then they cannot keep up with all of the rates um, to see the need to see people that are actually already in, in crisis or very close to crisis and reaching out for that help. Many others are not reaching out for help, so they're struggling in isolation and that can be very dangerous. Faculty and staff can be facing all of these issues, particularly faculty and staff and members of the university community that are from underrepresented groups themselves. And those underrepresented populations are increasing in the professoriate, in staff and administrative positions, and leadership. So really these issues kind of confront us all, not just students. Another factor that I think is very important to think about is the dominant culture of our time, which is busyness. We keep our busyness around us like a badge of honor and it can be um, such a norm that we're not even conscious when people say, how are you doing? We mostly answer busy in one way or another using one phrase or another. So the norm is to take on more and more and more wherever we are and whatever we're doing as a student, as a faculty, as a staff person, um, right until the edge that you feel like I just can't, I'm not sure I can meet all my responsibilities day to day. So people tend to just overload. And when there's an adverse social or political or personal event in one's life, in one's community, in one's family that uh, befalls people we care about in the world, in our own country or in, anywhere in the world, those adverse events also take a toll on our resilience. They increase our stress level. And people that are very busy and feel that they can barely meet their day-to-day -day obligations don't have any kind of buffer or cushion to allow for the increased toll that's taken when there are stressful events that happen to our loved ones in our communities and in the world. And those events are happening with great frequency. So it really creates um, quite a lot of challenge to be, to be had. So how do we do more than just try to keep growing counseling centers to treat people in crisis? How do we disrupt this norm to be so overloaded and stressed and anxious and worried all the time? In healthcare, there's been a move in the direction of preventative care. And I would uh, share a view that higher education should also move in the direction of preventative care towards um, enabling um, a positive life of well being, of wholeness, of flourishing, and helping people to cultivate their own capacities for flourishing, for increase of wisdom, for compassion, for oneself and for others. Contemplative approaches offer tools that can be integrated into all the mission areas of colleges and universities. And I'll talk a little bit about how they might show up in the academic, the co-curricular, and the healthcare missions across our institution types. Contemplative approaches in general allow us to establish better conscious control over our focus and attention. This is opposed to being distracted or having a wandering mind that we're not even aware of or we're aware that we're wandering, we don't know how to get centered again. Contemplative approaches also allow us to be more aware of and respond proactively to our emotions, to be aware of what's happening internally and externally in those we may be interacting with. And it allows us to develop more sensitive and effective methods of listening and communicating and interacting with others, which is particularly crucial for diversity and inclusion and for context, conflict resolution, trying to build a world that has more equity and more social justice. These skills are essential for helping students navigate their lives during college and after, but really they're essential for all of us. So contemplative approaches um, come in many, many forms and shapes and sizes. This is the tree of contemplative practices and uh, the website is there at contemplativemind.org. Our host today, C-Mind, was instrumental in helping to create this tree. And the last ACMHE webinar, I believe, was on the topic of how it was created. So you can go back into the ACMHE webinar archives and find out more about this contemplative uh, tree of practices. So I want to think a little bit now about how this might show up in, in different domains in higher education and the academic co-curricular in the work of faculty and staff and our lives at universities in research and service and outreach and in patient care. So in academics, there's a big focus on contemplative pedagogy and how it might be integrated into um, three credit academic classes as well as non-traditional classes that may be one or two credits. Um, they may be graded, they may be taken for pass fail or credit no credit. In the co-curricular domain at UVA, we partnered with um, our gym system, which is called Intramural Recreation Sports. And they've been a strong partner for us since the beginning of the, cent of the center's um, 
work in 2012 to the present. At this point, we offer four nights a week of free drop-in yoga classes, and we have six days a week um, through the purchase of a group exercise or yoga pass, um, Mysore Ashtanga yoga programming that's offered at a drop-in over a three-hour period, six days a week. So we, we now see about 6,000 people across our various uh, classes and co-curricular programs. These include special events and talks and other series, not just through our I, I Am Recreation Sports Partnership, but also hosted across all different locations on our campus. We offer a wide variety of contemplative approaches rather than trying to promote or popularize just a single approach. So we have uh, free drop-in classes offered as well as instruction in the one credit and three credit academic domain that will cover such topics as mindfulness, restorative yoga, tai chi, qigong, Alexander technique, many other forms of yoga like hatha flow, ashtanga, and a wide variety of other techniques such as contemplative listening, um, the use of dialogue for conflict resolution, etc. So we try to broaden the frame that people might bring when they think of a contemplative sciences center or what contemplative might mean to hold a very wide and inclusive definition that kind of grows and evolves all the time. Mm -hmm. We work a lot also with student health and they may be an ally on your campus to work with so if you're thinking about um, the co-curricular domain or even thinking about how to have a more proactive or preventative pedagogy in academic courses. You may also be able to gather counseling resources from colleagues, folks that work in registration and orientation mm -hmm. with first year students often have a wealth of resources to offer there. And thinking, you know, proactively, how can we help our students to be healthy and whole and served well during their entire time in our universities and colleges, whether that's just for a semester or for many years. I'll speak more in a moment about the faculty and staff dimension, um, but learning communities is one model that I'll talk about um, in some depth. There's also book clubs, drop in meditation sessions. You might partner with employee health and wellness. Um, you may find partners in um, units that are dedicated to faculty development and with allies like places um, for the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Virginia. That's called the Center for Teaching Excellence, and they're a strong partner for us. Also, our Women's Center. We've worked with our leadership development programming. Uh, we've worked with our vice provost for faculty development and many others at the school level. But those are some of the central uh, units who think about the well-being and wholeness of folks across either in class or beyond the classroom domain of our institutions. In research that you might think of engaging in your own professional field, whatever your primary discipline and training was, uh, looking at new research methods that are emerging that study the intersection between the field at hand and contemplative topics or contemplative approaches themselves. Uh, this is kind of emerging as a trend across all aspects of the academy. I notice sometimes it shows up at first as um, a breakout session on mindfulness um, as, as the buzzword, and mindfulness is certainly a popular word and term and, and is one style of uh, meditation that's wor worthy of study. And then there are many others in addition. So whether it's mindfulness or contemplation in some sort, uh, it's probably showing up somewhere in your national um, organization or your local regional organizations in your field. And if it's not, I would encourage you to help bring it there yourself and think of sharing something because there really is broad interest in what these intersections look like and how they might influence the ways we frame and conduct our research work. In terms of service, there are a lot of projects that might help the local, local community, um, having sort of participatory research methods or participatory engagement in um, community work. These might be integrated into curricular or co-curricular settings, um, perhaps hosting things for uh, guided listening and communication or facilitated dialogues. There are projects like writing blogs or having letter writing campaigns between members of the university community or class and members of a particular um, uh, part of the community. For example, we have an instructor at the University of Virginia who teaches yoga at our, our Fluvanna Women's Correctional Facility, the women's prison, and she teaches yoga to her students in her English classes and has had the students from both programs uh, writing letters and blogging together to kind of see how their progress in the, in the practice of yoga actually develops in a very similar way, whether they're in the correctional facility or in the university and developing sort of compassionate connections from there. 
patient care is kind of a massive um, area to talk about, and I'm not going to focus a lot of time on that today um, because we would run out of time together. Uh, but I encourage you to look, I'll share lots of places to look for resources later in the talk. We work at, uh, in our university closely with a UVA Center for Mindfulness who's housed in our School of Medicine, helps teach MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. We also work very closely with our School of Nursing's Compassionate Care Initiative. There's a lot of research in the healthcare domain about um, contemplative approaches helping patients to recover or to um, live with whatever illness may be um, taking place uh, with uh, greater, greater well-being outcomes and also for contemplative approaches helping those who are healthcare providers, uh, especially in preventing uh, the risk of burnout. So my talk today I called um, the faith in the seed strategies to nurture and embed contemplative approaches at our institutions. So there's kind of a continuum and I invite you to think about where you are, where your institution might be at this time. Um, you know, at some point there was some single person on a campus probably somewhere that thought this stuff's great, I'm going to bring it into my work somehow. Perhaps they had a practice outside of work and decided to start integrating it in the field. And then they may find, we may find there are like-minded others. So it's important to see if there are other people at your institution who have some compatible interests to try to align those interests in some ways and to ally yourselves together so you don't feel like you're carrying the burden alone. Small interest groups can form, so hosting a book club, hosting an informal gathering, a get-together, um, trying to put a little money and have a tea and cookie reception, you know, pizza, free pizza, see who comes out. Uh, eventually more formal gatherings emerge and I, I'll talk a little more about some of those in a minute. And then people usually begin to think about funding. How do we get some money to do something with this? Uh, it may be for course design to support some research, uh, maybe for something in co-curricular domain in service or in healthcare. If the small interest groups and the formal gatherings then begin to create some momentum, uh, you see larger efforts emerging, particularly once funding becomes part of the picture, people start to have some dedicated time perhaps within their, um, their load where they're recognized for this portion of their work. And that's a big uh, factor in helping to prevent burnout in the long term, getting some protected time during a sabbatical or within one's given load. And then establishing formal initiatives or learning communities or something like a center, such as we have here at UVA. And then seeking larger scale and sustainable funding so that from year to year you know that this might continue forward. Another thing that happens is we begin to seek to sustain it in our curriculum. That's certainly where we are at UVA is trying to think about how to do this in, in a very thoughtful manner. Uh, Brown University is a real pioneer in this, having established um, their concentrations, uh, the equivalent of, of a major in both contemplative contemplative sciences and then they have another contemplative studies which is more of the liberal arts track and so we begin to think about how to create minors or majors whether to establish graduate programs in the beginning to do so and eventually once there's enough curriculum and degrees granted within a field you see departments that begin to emerge and I think we're probably on the very cusp of those departments and there are of course some smaller universities like Naropa who have an entirely contemplative mission and so all of their departments are inherently contemplative but within the larger kind of conventional sectors of higher education whether it's community college public universities or private universities there's this growing trend towards seeing larger efforts larger scale sustainable funding and the move to sustain it in, in some sort of curricular fashion. So places to find funding might include um, going to donors, which can be alumni, other philanthropists, um, looking for internal funding mechanisms. It may not be labeled contemplative, but if you can find a way to align your goal with the funding mechanism, you should go for it, even if it's kind of a generic or general fund. Uh, there may be community or business partners with missions that are allied, that are um, willing to help invest in something or to co-host something. There are foundations in this field, places like the Templeton Foundation, who fund projects like this. So going on to the ACMHE website or the Mind and Life Institute website and starting to look around for uh, those that support that organization and those that are supporting funding mechanisms and calls for proposals that are circulated. And then the national organizations in the space themselves can be um, sometimes run funding opportunities, may be helpful in locating other funding opportunities. So CMIND, our host today, and the Association for Contemplative Mind and Higher Ed, ACMHE, are 
really my first stop whenever I'm thinking about these things. And the Mind and Life Institute is another organization that helps to bring contemplatives together with scientists especially, but now those are academics from not just the, the, hard, the hard sciences per se, but also social sciences and fields across the liberal arts these days. So Mind and Life Institute is a wonderful organization. If you've not heard of it before, I recommend checking them out. And then looking at both curricular and co-curricular and seeing which um, area you wish to put your time in and if you would like to see that established in the other domain but it's not within your bandwidth to do so, maybe finding a partner that you could help to support rather than trying to do it all yourself. So the main mantra is don't do it all yourself if there's any help to be had and keep thinking very proactively about where help might come from. Students are very interested in this and they may be willing to do an independent study with you or um, a work study if you can get that kind of arrangement. We have graduate programs that work with us to offer graduate student labor as part of a research project. With graduate students, they can sometimes incorporate this into their thesis or dissertation work. That might give you several years of study interaction with them. Um, again, looking for other faculty, staff, or students and other centers like a Center for Teaching and Learning or Student Health or Employee Health. I want to take a moment here to invite everybody to just, if you have something to write with, if not, just to reflect a little bit. And we'll just spend about two or three minutes on this. What is a challenge that you face personally in planting and nurturing contemplative approaches at your institution? Try to think of just one specific challenge. If more than one comes to mind, just select one specific challenge that you're trying to get something contemplative to, to first bloom. You planted it, you're wanting the first seed to sprout, or maybe you're wanting to nurture it and see it grow. I'll give you um, about a minute to reflect on that. As you're writing down what this challenge is, or just reflecting on it consciously, um, think a little bit about who else besides you also cares about this challenge. Are there people? Are there particular offices or units dedicated to this issue? Are there interest groups of any kind of constituent, student, faculty, or staff? Who might the allies in this concern be? And if you think of multiple potential groups that share this concern, just brainstorm those and try to write down a list. And finally, what other resources would help you to address this challenge in a positive way, proactive way? Do you need more people as your resource, students or colleagues? Do you personally need time for yourself or others? Is it advocacy and buy-in? Is it an issue that needs to be addressed through top-level support? Is it something that can be addressed through a grassroots initiative? Funding may be an issue, but I encourage you to think broadly about all kinds of resources that might help to address this, this challenge. Um, funding would certainly be included, I think. And I encourage you to come back to this thought later and maybe reflect on it a little further. We don't have a lot of time for this break here, but I wanted to give you a moment to kind of think about something um, specific as we move forward. So contemplative faculty learning communities are a particular model, and I will put out notes following this talk that'll include some notes that might be responsive to questions that come up in a few more minutes when we do the Q&A. And I will include um, a little bit more detail in the notes about faculty learning communities. 
Um, specifically, faculty learning communities are a type of community of practice that are defined as a group of faculty members who engage in an active, collaborative, year-long program with a curriculum about teaching and learning and with frequent seminars and activities providing learning development, the scholarship of teaching, and community building. That is a specific de definition that I, I'm pulling from Cox and Richland's 2004 article on building faculty learning communities. This model has been modified to be broader than just that definition, but that's, that's very similar to how we dealt with it at the University of Virginia. We used this definition to create a contemplative faculty learning community. I presented on this um, with my colleague who was a participant in the learning community, Kirsten Gelsdorf, in 2018 at UNC Chapel Hill at a regional Mid-Atlantic conference called the Contemplative Practices in Higher Education Conference. So I'm also referring a little bit to some of the things I shared um, in that session. So at UVA, the first contemplative pedagogy program was also a, a learning community. It was nine months in length um, versus 12 months. And it's before I was at the university, but not part of the Contemplative Sciences Center at that time. And this was actually hosted through the Center for Teaching Excellence, who I've mentioned has been a longtime supporter and leader at our institution for this work. They received a grant, um, a teaching and learning center grant from ACMHE, and it was facilitated by Dorte Bach and John Alexander. They had, they had six participants who attended a week-long course design institute and had seven subsequent monthly meetings through the summer and ended at the end of a fall semester. We also held a faculty learning community that I uh, facilitated, the Contemplative Faculty Learning Community, or CFLC, in academic year 2017-18. This was funded by philanthropy versus a specific outside um, grant dedicated to this program. We had 17 participants. I'm sorry, I've dropped a digit here. It says seven, but it was 17 participants. They included 15 faculty and two graduate students who were instructors of record teaching their own courses. They also did the week-long course design institute and wanted to do longer um, retreat uh, format together versus just monthly meetings. So we did three different day-long retreats. Um, we did one in August, another in February, and one that closed the year together the following August. In between during the semester, we did monthly meetings and some special events. We, uh, I gave an assessment to the group and everyone was able to redesign or design a new uh, course. At least one course was influenced by this. Usually multiple courses saw innovations. We did a lot of joint presentations to share this work. Um, I co-facilitated with a member of the, the CFLC at the ACM, ACMHE national meeting this past October um, at UMass. We had the regional conference, UNC Chapel Hill, and four of us, myself and three of the members of the learning community, presented at a campus-wide uh, conference that's held every year called the Innovation and Pedagogy Summit. One member received a research grant, Kirsten Gelsdorf, and she and I are still collaborators on a grant that spun off from the process. We also have a world languages working group because nine of our 17 cohort participants were from world language departments. They're from across different departments. We're actually hosting a day-long retreat for any faculty members from across the world languages that we expect about 50 people at UVA to attend on May 3rd this year. So we continue to see this ripple effect. I wanted to share other models though. Ours is not the only one. Um, there was a multi-institutional uh, grant from C-Mines, Building Communities Grant. Stephanie Briggs, Michelle Chapman, and Renee Hill presented about this at the 2017 ACMHE conference. They had six inst institutions participate. Uh, four were HBCUs, two were predominantly white universities, and they had 12 members. They held three retreats across nine months and really focused on um, connecting and community building and the incorporation of strategies into the classroom, especially strategies, uh, contemplative practices informed by African and African-American practices. They saw in their assessment that their, the strong importance of connection and community building, the importance of the network that was established, and that members were able to incorporate things into their pedagogy. Not all things are called learning communities, some are just called communities. At Plymouth State University in New Hampshire, there's a program called Contemplative Communities that was founded and facilitated by Carolyn Kinane, who just recently came on board at UPA but had been at Plymouth State University for 15 years. She launched this in 2001. It goes on to the present. It does not have any direct funding, so they've just cobbled together this um, incredibly impactful program without necessarily having uh, standalone funding. They started as a reading circle of 15 faculty. They ran winter and summer meetings and workshops during their faculty 
Faculty Week with their Center for Teaching Excellence. In 2015, they updated the name from, to the Contemplative Communities and added an advisory board that included faculty, staff, students, and community members. They launched Meditative Mondays in the Student Union, and there was a student organization call, called CAPE uh, for Contemplative Action Purposeful Expression that also emerged out of this effort. In 2017, as I mentioned, this often moves into the curricular domain. Carolyn Kinane and two colleagues created a four-course general education pathway called a Contemplative Pathway through their foundation requirements. At the Community College of Baltimore County, yet another institution type, Stephanie Briggs founded and for, for several years led a contemplative community circle program. They started as a community of practice. In their second year together, they added a food pantry project to have a positive com community impact project. In year three, they added a mini conference with a student focus and had 45 students and many other people come to a partial day Saturday event. In that year, Stephanie brought on co-facilitator Amy Pacino to help in the leadership, and then eventually, because of sabbatical that was upcoming, Amy took over leadership and then brought on another new co-facilitator, David Hewitt, and they're now facilitating the move into year four, where they plan to scale up the mini-conference. They're also adding some classroom pre- and post-assessments of contemplative pedagogies that people, members of the contemplative community circle have now put into their classes. I hope to offer a facilitators network meetup. So if any of you are out there planning to design or lead a contemplative community or contemplative faculty learning community in the coming year or so, um, please email me. It's trail, my last name, at virginia.edu. These slides will be posted later. So if you're thinking about this, come back to this slide. I encourage you, as you're thinking about building your case on your institutions, um, to think about quantitative and qualitative data, both humanistic and empirical. Um, that's both at small scale, very personal, such as quotes or storytelling or dialogue data. Uh, you might do a second person-oriented campaign. So photos and social media sharing can create a groundswell uh, approach, seeing this kind of take off across the campus um, as an effort that could go viral, for example. The first person is also something we really honor in contemplative approaches. So providing opportunities for others to really have their own transformative experience. How can people know for themselves why this is so important? And make sure you yourself still get to do the practice that you preserve time for the things that inspired you to be in this field in the first place. That can be hard as we dedicate ourselves to service and growth for others to remember, um, keep exploring for yourself. The C-Mind organization has a contemplative community building toolkit link here that's wonderful. Strongly recommend this. They also have launched recently a contemplative education bibliography and that has really good resources um, across disciplines and they have good subheadings to surf for different topics that may be relevant to you and your, your own campus. You want to find evidence in the field that's compelling to the audience that you think is the ally or the resource that's going to help you take this effort to the next level of being nurtured in your school. Finally, at the University of Virginia, we've created a tool called Mandala. It's an online portal that will be launched in the fall of 2019. We're already um, creating a lot of content that will go live when it gets launched in the fall, and it'll have a very large digital library of resources on contemplation and human flourishing. So please do check back, check back at the University of Virginia. You're welcome to join the Contemplative Sciences Center email list if you go to our website. Um, there is a link to sign up for the email list. My last message today before we do Q&A um, is to have faith in the seeds. This is a photograph of the Baker's Globe Mallow flower. It blooms only after a forest fire. Sometimes the events and the stressors in our world right now seem like things are perhaps uh, um, close to coming on fire, perhaps they already are. But there are special flowers that wait for such conditions. There are 386 species of flowers that bloom after the fires that crop cut across Australasia and South Africa. So there are many forms of life that are hardy and resilient. Our contemplative approaches, I think, are some of those. They are forms of, of life-bearing um, practices. And they are waiting for conditions to be right, and they we hope to see them bloom right before us. You plant it, you want to see this beautiful little plant immediately um, take hold and come forward. You may or may not see it so quickly. So continue to hold, have faith in the seeds even if you can't see the immediate fruit of the labors. Finally, last minute before we turn to um, Q&A that Maya will facilitate, I'd like to share this poem, Oceans, to leave on a, a contemplative note from this, my remarks. This is a poem by Juan Ramon Jimenez. 
I have a feeling that my boat has struck down there in the depths against a great thing and nothing happens, nothing, silence, waves, nothing happens or has everything happened? And we, and are we standing now quietly in the new life? Thank you very much for your time and attention today. I'm very grateful to have been invited to speak with all of you. I'd like to turn it over now to Maya to facilitate some questions for us. My contact information is there at the bottom of this final slide. Thank you so much, Juliet, um, <clears throat> for sharing um, that actually that last poem and um, all of the wonderful information. Um, so folks, I'd like to welcome you all to submit your questions. One of the first questions that came in uh, was about the research in contemplative sciences that you do and how you share your research in contemplative sciences. Thank you. Yes, um, there are a wide variety of things that we do. Some is um, ongoing standard program evaluation, so we wouldn't necessarily um, publish about that research, but that helps us to see if we are meeting program goals and how we can continuously improve what we do. So we try to conduct a lot of surveys with those who attend our programs, particularly classes or longer sustained programs. Um, all of our retreats, we do evaluations, so we have kind of a standard practice for um, the types of questions we modify it to meet the particular um, goals and learning objectives of each given program. We have a large K-12 through program that's been managed by um, our executive director, David Germano, in partnership with the Curry School of Education, uh, particularly Tish Jennings is the, the PI, principal investigator, um, with the Compassionate Schools Project. They are working in Louisville, Kentucky with the largest randomized controlled trial that's yet been done in K-12. And um, they have 20,000 students participating in an entirely innovative um, health and nutrition and wellness curriculum, learning about things in an entirely contemplative approach. The teachers are trained in the new approach as well as the students receiving the new curriculum. So that's very large scale research that we do. We also partner with schools such as um, the Department of Psychology and UVA School of Medicine. We have a grant um, through NIH um, with Kim Pemberthy and Jim Cohn and colleagues at the University of Toronto to study a contemplative intervention with lupus patients. So that'll be published about in the journals relevant to those disciplines and fields. Um, we have smaller scale research. We have a, um, a student flourishing initiative that is studying our, our class, the art and science of human flourishing that was developed in a partnership with the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Penn State University. And it has a research team that are in parallel to the curriculum design team, of which I'm just one um, member who helped to deliver this curriculum as co-instructor of the course this fall. But there's a large team of, of experts from across these institutions with some outside help as well that were brought in to design this as a best practice course on human flourishing. And we're doing research to study that. So we'll be publishing about that in um, journals dedicated to contemplative um, pedagogy and student impacts work. It's kind of cutting across um, uh, sectors, so I'm not quite sure. The new portal that I mentioned, which will be this contemplative university of flourishing on human flourishing, um, that'll be hosted through this technology called Mandala that we've developed. When that goes live in the fall, it's going to give us a, a repository to post about our research in, in a one-stop kind of way. Right now we're publishing across multiple types of journals and uh, fields because our work is very interdisciplinary. So I'll let that stand for now. I just encourage anybody interested to come to the Contemplative Sciences in our website, sign up for our email, and then please check back in the fall once our portal goes live. The, the research will really be centralized there. Great, thank you so much. Um, so two, um, two individuals submitted some challenges um, during the mm -hmm. reflective practice, mm -hmm. and I think that these two that I'm going to share with everyone are um, likely um, questions that other folks have as well. And I think they're addressed at, um, they were addressed in the where to start slide, but um, the two questions are the biggest, I believe, is what steps do we start with? And relatedly, um, how to identify who will be 
your allies. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I encourage folks to, to go back through the slides when they're public, um, put online later this week uh, to kind of uh, take whatever's helpful there about thinking about that continuum of how things move from single actors to you know, a few people finding each other yeah. to gathering in an informal setting, perhaps developing something more formal like a book club, a reading group, a learning community, a community of practice, a conference planning community, something that begins to formalize your efforts where you have some help. And not uh, neglecting to think about all the constituencies across your local community as well as your university community as people who may have resources to bring to bear to help you. Uh, people that care about what you care about, being very clear and intentional about your goals and your passions. What excites you? What inspired you to do this? Um, why do you know it to be valuable and important and true? Really writing about those things, journaling about them, reflecting about them, to be clear on your intentions and your inspirations can help you to find that kind of passionate, compelling language to bring allies on board. And then speaking about this um, as much as you can with others that you suspect may have common interests. Uh, if through uh, doing it in classes or co-curricular programs, you might, might find students that are willing to come on board and do some legwork to help you think about this. Um, shouldn't take for granted, you know, students get very inspired. They want to do a lot of work with volunteerism and student organizations, and so they might be partners that can help um, take some of the load off so that one person is not trying to do all of this alone. I think that's the biggest thing that leads to burnout and people feeling like their bandwidth is just so overtaxed, is not having enough help. Um, so just forging as many allies and partnerships as you can and being clear what your goals are and then thinking who else shares these goals. So the same kind of process we went through in the reflective writing moment of just thinking about what are all the kinds of resources that would help this to grow, to flourish here? What are all the kinds of people or groups or units that have similar goals or missions to the kinds of things that I'm pointing at, that I'm led by? And, and working to align and kind of broaden the language so that maybe there's space for a group of allies to uh, be invested together, everybody pulling together on this and um, helping it to grow across different kinds of activities. So that's my recommendation is just keep keep making friendships, um, being part of these national organizations like CMIND and the ACMHE, um, the Mind and Life Institute, the regional conference in the Mid-Atlantic is open to anyone from around the world across the country who'd like to come to the uh, spring contemplative practices in higher ed conference. ACMHE's national meeting is in October usually, um, and that is a wonderful place to um, get fortified and reinvigorated and make friends, and it certainly helped me personally to understand this field in a much more um, extensive, subtle, uh, inspiring way is to be at the ACMHE meetings and to the contemplative practices and higher ed conferences and getting to know people there. Thank you. Yeah, I was actually um, thinking of adding that by attending these events that you're listing, um, you can also learn from other folks who are who have found ways um, to bring to bring this to their campuses as well. Um, <clears throat> I think this question is also related um, about how to go about convincing or um, legitimizing the seriousness of this endeavor, um, you know, to to your um, administrators or to whomever it is that you have to sort of prove this to. Yeah, I think it can be helpful to um, enter into a deep listening mode with those people who would be incredible allies and advocates of the work, and how do they frame and describe the things that matter to them? Because they may, in going through the challenges of our times, the challenges of their role or their campus or your, um, you know, some initiative, they may hit upon something that is the same phrasing or maybe very different phrasing, but is actually speaking to one of the things that's your own that you relate to, that you see contemplative approaches, contemplative practices as helping to address. And thinking about framing it in terms of the questions that drive us, these beautiful questions, these maddening questions and issues and challenges. If we can agree that something is serious and in need of attention, 
as I started the talk with addressing like, the mental health crisis on campus, it's incredibly well documented. And that can be a place where you might get the Vice President of Student Affairs or the Chief Academics Officer or the Vice Provost for Faculty Development or your College President or a Department Chair um, or you know someone in the Advancement and Fundraising Office may be inspired and excited and thinking with you about how to do something proactively to create this kind of preventative care approach, this pro proactive um, framing of the roles that colleges and universities could play in helping people to explore and investigate um, in ways that still cultivate their resilience, still help us to be whole and well, that help us to, to have the capacity to flourish. Uh, so framing it around language and questions and challenges that are identified by this ally that you seek is really helpful. So listening first and then reflecting a lot on what alignment might be and what language or data or evidence might be compelling to this audience person. If it's an office that values data, even if you're not good with data, try to find someone in the network here through ACMHE or at your institution or even just a colleague. They might not even care about contemplative approaches, but just say, okay, here's my here's my issue. I need to put this in data terms. What what what's effective there so you might have to do a little bit of legwork to figure out how to build the argument using language that's meaningful to your audience but it really helps to be kind of flexible in that coming up with that yeah thank you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um the person who submitted that question responded immediately saying that was a really good advice. So thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, and you all have my support because I've had so many conversations about that question. <laughs> um, and so that was really inspiring my talk today. I, I'm hoping that all these things might help us to think. It's very idiosyncratic also. Some, some of this is about context and so it's hard to give the one one perfect answer. That's one thing because I don't think people need to hear one thing. I think there are many things that we have to develop to create our arguments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next question is, um, if you could say more about how to work with teaching and learning centers, and if you think there is opportunity there for more contemplative programming. Yes, um, well, teaching and learning centers have their own um, names, their own reporting lines, their own mandates and missions. And so at some institutions, we're very fortunate at the University of Virginia, our Center for Teaching Excellence was originally founded as a teaching resource center, teaching research center, TRC, now CTE. And they've been around for more than 25 years and they've always been very proactive in thinking about innovative pedagogy for all types of purposes. Um, there's a push right now to think about democracy and how democracy shows up in the classroom, thinking about um, social justice and inclusion and techniques for inclusion. That's a place where we're hoping to partner with them in the coming year to bring contemplative pedagogy into the conversation, into dialogue with people that care about the democratization and inclusion of our classes and our campuses. So again, it's about finding interest areas that align and perhaps the, the Framing is not using contemplative language, but you might see a way to make it one of the potential approaches, one of the types of tools that's useful in addressing something. So it can help to just meet with them and befriend them, go to their programs, see how they frame things, get on their mailing list, um, and just learn uh, from them what, what seems to be working well, because the centers vary in size and scope and mission. Some include um, addressing research concerns, some are entirely pedagogically teaching classroom focused, some work with grad students, some don't. So the, the centers vary across institutions. It's just a matter of getting to know your particular center and seeing if there's interest. And um, it, it may not be, the center may have a mission or um, may be at its maximum bandwidth already and, and it might not be the place you find traction. So don't get too discouraged and, and try to come up with a backup list. If it isn't that center, there are probably some others you might try. But I do think that they're fantastic allies um, here at UVA. We're, we're incredibly grateful for our center having been a strong partner to us. Great. Thank you. Um, so actually, I think that's going to be the last question for today. Um, Juliet, I want to thank you again for sharing this work with everyone and um, providing such um, helpful information for this process. Um, so I want to remind everyone that's still on that this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the website soon. 
Our webinars are made possible by your support, so we invite you to make a donation and check out our webinar archive at contemplativemind.org. Um, I am happy to announce that we are extending the proposal submission deadline for the 2019 ACMHG conference uh, that Juliet mentioned a few times um, to May 13th. So um, if you were nervous about getting it in on time, you have a little extra time. You can learn more and um, by visiting the www.acmheconference.org. You can read the CFP there. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone that applications for the 2019 summer session are open and being accepted on a rolling basis. To learn more and apply, you can visit www.contemplativemind.org backslash programs backslash summer. Um, you may not be aware of this since we have such a wide reach, but in actuality, the Center for Contemplative Mind is just full four time I'm sorry, full, four full-time staff members, and um, your donations really do make a difference no matter what the size. Uh, thank you again, Juliet, and thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you.